When we first introduced the consumer model, we began with the idea of a consumption bundle. We used the vertical axis to measure the x2 good, and we used the horizontal axis to measure the x1 good. And we said that every point in this space represents a different combination of x1 and x2. So every point in the space represents a different consumption bundle. We then said we could add a third axis to this graph and use it to measure utility. So we could keep our x2 axis, keep our x1 axis. In other words, keep the plane that contains all the consumption bundles, exactly the same plane as this, but introduce a new axis and measure utility on that axis. Every consumption bundle gives rise to a different level of utility. And as we trace out that level of utility for each of these consumption bundles, we're tracing out what we ended up calling a utility function. We're not going to do something very similar for producers, except instead of talking about consumption bundles, we're going to talk about input bundles. Inputs are the things we use to produce outputs. And the two inputs we're going to focus on are labor and capital. So now we have a space of input bundles instead of a space of consumption bundles. Every point gives us a different combination of capital and labor. And for each combination of capital and labor, we're going to be able to produce a certain level of output given whatever the state of technology is. So when we bring capital and labor into our lower picture, and have this lower plane that contains all the possible input bundles, what we'll use the third axis for is to measure how much output we can produce with each of these combinations of inputs. So we'll put output on the vertical axis, we'll denote it by x, and we'll be able to trace out how much output we we're able to produce for different input bundles. And as we do that, we're tracing out what we call a production function. Now one of the important differences between production and utility functions that I'd like to note at the outset is that what we're measuring on the vertical axis now is objectively measurable. We can measure output. We can measure what comes out of the factory in a way that we couldn't measure utility because there's no objective measure of utility. So when it came to tastes or preferences, we said that what really matters is the shape of the indifference curves that make up the indifference map of the consumer. And because there isn't just one way of measuring utility, there are lots of utility functions that can be used to represent any particular map of indifference curves. But this is not going to be true for producers. For producers, we can measure what's on this vertical axis. So we can't use lots of different production functions to represent the technology that's being used to convert inputs into outputs. Okay, so we'll have to keep that in mind. But what does one of these production functions actually look like? Well, I have one over here. Where we have labor on this axis capital on this axis, and output on this axis, exactly as we did over here. So you can see in this picture that in this production function, as labor and capital increase, we're moving up a mountain. We're initially moving up that mountain at a faster and faster rate, but eventually at a slower and slower rate. So that means that as we increase labor and capital, it initially becomes easier and easier to produce more. We're going up the mountain at a faster and faster pace, but eventually it gets harder and harder to produce more. We're going up the mountain at a slower and slower pace. And the way that we've drawn this particular production function, that's true in any direction. So if we go along a diagonal on the lower plane and we increase both capital and labor, we're initially going up at a faster and faster rate, eventually at a slower and slower rate. The same in any di other direction that we go. Now, if you're curious, the underlying production function that's being used to graph this picture is in the equation 12.56 in the textbook, which is a much more complicated equation than anything we're going to work with in this class. So don't let it scare you, but if you're curious, it's there.
So here then we have a production function that tells us for any combination of labor and capital how much output we're able to produce. But as we start out developing our theory of the firm, we're not going to start out with this more complicated production function. We're going to start out with something simpler that we're going to call a short-run production function. In the short run, we're going to assume that you've already chosen your level of capital. You've already chosen your factory space. You've already chosen the machines that go into that space. And the only choice that remains is how many workers to hire, how much labor to hire. So if capital is already fixed because you've already chosen it, that means we've already fixed where we are on this axis. So the only thing that matters in the short run is where we're going to move in terms of labor. So in the short run, we're then operating on a slice of this production function that holds capital fixed. A slice like this. Whatever capital we have, we keep it fixed in the short run, and we just decide how much labor we should hire. So that's what we mean by a short-run production function. It's a slice of this longer-run production function where you can vary both capital and labor. So what would one of those slices look like? Well, we can trace that out. We just speak green. Suppose we're at this level of capital here. Now, the only choice remains how much workers, how many workers are we going to hire, how much labor are we going to hire. And so we go up this production function in this vertical slice here. Or we could pick a higher level of capital. Suppose we had a bigger factory with more machines in it. Then in the short run, that's fixed, so we're just hiring workers. We go up that mountain, but we go up higher because we have more capital to start with. So those would be the shapes of the short run production functions. And because we're operating on this slice, we can graph that in two dimensions. So we can graph just labor on this axis because we've held capital fixed and then graph output on the vertical axis. That's this slice. And we can see the shape of what this short-run production function is going to look like if the underlying long-run production function looks like this. It's going to have the shape that initially it gets steeper and eventually it gets shallower. So this tell me, tells me for the fixed level of capital, as labor increases, initially it gets easier and easier to produce as a high labor, and eventually it gets harder and harder to produce. And of course, if we increase the amount of capital, if we compare this to a factory that has more capital than my factory, then we would end up on a different short-run production function. We'd end up on this one out here. And since that has more capital to begin with, for any level of labor, we're going to be able to produce more. So it's going to lie somewhere out here. But that's how we derive short-run production functions. They simply hold capital fixed, and we operate on a vertical slice of this longer-run production function.